Hello and welcome to Religion, Peace and Sanctuary. Thank you all for joining us today for this special international webinar. My name is Ethan Vesley Flad. I'm Director of National Organizing at the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Our speakers and audience today are joining from all across the world. I am welcoming you, welcoming you today from Asheville, North Carolina in the United States, ancestral land of the Cherokee people. I'd like to start by uh, naming and introducing my co-host, Susan Smith, Director of Operations at the Fellowship of Reconciliation and a member of the Muslim Peace Fellowship. She'll be speaking shortly. Um, I'll be offering some just initial words about housekeeping, housekeeping for the program. Um, Susan and I will be your hosts and moderators for this two hour international webinar. Hopefully all of you, or at least most of you have used Zoom uh, for all types of programs, meetings, webinars, but just to note that there are different functionalities in Zoom for this uh, webinar. We wanna direct your attention to using two of them throughout the course of this program. There is a chat functionality at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the chat, you can uh, use that to please introduce yourself, put your name and where you're joining from. Perhaps you have affiliations that you'd like to share with us about movements that you work with that relate to the context and topics of today's program. We'd love to hear that and know who you are. We also have a Q&A function that if you click on that, that is a way to direct a question during the course of the program to our panelists and moderators so that we can receive that and, and incorporate that into our conversation, especially into the Q&A portion toward the last half hour of our two hour program. So um, now I'd like to name the three co-sponsoring organizations for this event. It is hosted by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, FOR USA, as well as the International Sanctuary Declaration Campaign and the International Peace Bureau World Congress. The Fellowship of Reconciliation, founded in 1915, is the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in North America. FOR USA is a member of the global international FOR movement with branches in more than 40 countries going back more than a century. FOR USA's mission is to organize, train, and grow a diverse movement that welcomes all people of conscience to end structures of violence and war and create peace through the transformative power of nonviolence. The International Sanctuary Declaration is a statement that sets forth five principles of sanctuary, compassionate response, due process, family unity, restorative justice, and civil initiative, which together can be used to guide grassroots and governmental response to the global escalation of displacement. It is in conformity and in solidarity with the UN Convention relating to the status of refugees in, of 1951 which was a multilateral treaty that defines who is a refugee and sets out the rights of individuals who are granted asylum and the responsibilities of nations that grant asylum. To view the International Sanctuary Declaration and its list of more than 100 organizational endorsers, we will put into the chat uh, the website and also an email address so that your organization or movement can join on. And this is certainly a very auspicious and timely moment to be having this conversation about sanction and such issues. We'll be hearing more about the International Sanctuary Declaration from one of our panelists, um, but at this very moment, as so many people are fleeing uh, war and conflict in Afghanistan especially, this is a time when we all are holding that particularly close to our hearts. So thank you all for joining. I wanna now turn it over to my colleague, Susan Smith, who's gonna share more about the third co-sponsor and lead us into a video, a short video. Susan, we can't hear you. Thank you. Um, the International Peace Bureau was founded in 1891, and it's the world's oldest international peace federation. It was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1910 for acting as a link between peaceful societies of various countries. 
and it has offices in Berlin, Geneva, and Barcelona. Its membership is more than uh, 300 organizations in 70 countries. In 2017, it served as the lead organizer, uh, hosting a World Peace Congress in Berlin. And now it is gearing up for its second World Peace Congress, uh, which will be October 15th to 17th in Barcelona. And this will be a hybrid conference, uh, both in person and online. And uh, Ethan will be putting the registration link uh, or informational link in the chat. And most of the panelists on today's webinar will be presenting a similar workshop on religion, peace, and sanctuary at that event. And um, to set the tone for today and for the International Peace Bureau World Congress, we'd like to start uh, by sharing this video by Professor Noam Chomsky. Every problem we face has a feasible solution. There's a feasible solution to the pandemic. How do we know that? Because many countries are implementing. What about heating the environment? Yes, there are feasible measures essentially meet the IPC standards, give us a fair chance of a solving the problem, even a better existence. Nuclear weapons, obviously, we know how to deal with them, get rid of them. Case by case, there's almost nothing that we don't have a way to deal with. What's missing? The will and the commitment. Uh, is organized human society capable of getting to that point? Your speculation's as good as mine. The only thing we can do is hope that it's true, put all our efforts and energy into trying to make it become true. There's no alternative. Thank you, Susan, for sharing that uh, very somber and very powerful video. I now want to introduce for an opening prayer, um, my colleague, uh, our executive director at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson. Um, Emma is the executive director of FOR USA. She is an ordained Baptist, Baptist minister who serves as executive pastor of Concord Baptist Church of Christ in New York City and serves on many organizational boards, including as president of American Baptist Churches of Metro New York. Reverend Emma is a nationally recognized religious leader, liberationist and abolitionist, and human rights advocate for children, women, and families. Emma, welcome. Thank you for offering us these words today. Good day and welcome to all. I'd ask that you would please center your hearts in the deepest place of your love as I offer this beginning prayer for us. And I am praying in, in the tradition of my faith and with the hopes of my ancestors. We're drawn together today to hold religion, peace and sanctuary by our creator who has shaped us all with love. Oh God, give us thankful hearts for the organizers of today's webinar, for all who are present and all who are joining us. 
may we provoke each other today toward confidence in ourselves, our powers, and our purposes in the rightness of our rejection of war and violence and displacement and the lack of hospitality, and then the rightness of our struggles for peace. I invoke the words of my ancestors who prayed asking God to grant us the vision and the will to be found on the right side of justice. Help us to remember that here as so often elsewhere, no impossible wisdom is asked of us. Only your ancient and evergreen call to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with you and with each other, to refuse to use of the world's goods more than we need and to be generous with all. No impossible wisdom is asked of us only to love wider. No impossible wisdom is asked of us only to dream bigger. No impossible wisdom is asked of us only to work together to relegate all that oppresses us to history, all that feeds our will for justice and action to abide deeply in our fellowship now, and all that inspires us to write a better letter to the future to stretch our imaginations forward. Oh God, we yearn in our day to see the fulfillment of your vision of peace. May we be inspired this day to throw off false ideals of conquest and empire and the tinsels of war. And may we dig deep into the wells of our faiths to call more of your creation into this work of being the beloved community. May we who believe in peace among all nations strive for that as a present, practical, feasible reality. And may we follow the example of your every new day mercy to persist in our call for everyday love and peace for all. This prayer I offer in the spirit of the one who shows us that mercy and truth do me and righteousness and peace shall kiss one another. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Emma. Uh, so to frame this conversation, um, we uh, know all of us here uh, that this year we are approaching approximately 100 million forcibly displaced people and um, this is what the UN is telling us, but uh, only God really knows the, the true number of people who are displaced. And this number does not include, for example, the homeless, of which we here in the United States have millions, uh, for example. And in this world uh, where we have so many people who are displaced from their homes as a result of proxy wars and economic exploitation, uh, these are led by superpowers, um, brutal dictatorships, oppression and persecution of civilians, climate catastrophes, and uh, other uh, events that are wrought upon, first and foremost, the indigenous populations. And it is mostly by colonial powers, multinational corporations, and the military industrial complex that they are being displaced. And in fact, the governments that hold permanent seats on the so-called UN Security Council, and especially the United States, hold primary responsibility for this state of global mayhem and despair, as they are the largest purveyors of warfare, venture capitalism, global heating, exploitation of indigenous land and resources, and motivated to perpetuate their world, wealth and world domination. In April uh, 1967 at New York City's Riverside Church, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King delivered a sermon against imperialism that offered a profound diagnosis of militarism, poverty, and racism as the three evils of society and plague of Western civilization. 
he called for a radical revolution of values and a need for people to have a deep-seated aversion to justice. There comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him that is right, that it is right, said King. It is in this spirit that we invite you to today's conversation with six radical visionaries and activists for peace who have been inspired by their faith traditions to use their power, privilege, and trust in God in the struggle to end war, open borders, and provide sanctuary, honoring the dignity and human rights of all people. As you will hear, their brave and principled ad principled advocacy has sometimes put them at odds with their governments and co-religionists. So the format, uh, each speaker will speak for seven minutes, uh, sharing their uh, work and their work in particular as it relates to sanctuary and uh, uh, migration solidarity. And um, then after about seven minutes, they're gonna share a bit about how their faith inspires them to do this work to assist people on the move. And um, this will then uh, be followed by Q&A after we hear from each speaker. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ethan to introduce our speakers. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, and again, thank you, Emma, for that beautiful prayer to lead us into today's program. Um, we have a wonderful uh, collection of speakers today, and I, I'm going to give brief overviews to each of their uh, work, and then we're going to let each of them say more about that directly during the course of their presentation. So uh, first, I'm going to in introduce Reverend Bob Brashear, um, who is co-founder of the International Sanctuary Declaration Campaign and Network at Presbyterian Church USA's Committee on Central America and the Border Crisis. Um, Bob's migration and border solidarity work dates back to the 1980s when he was involved in the first Witness for Peace action on the Nicaragua-Honduras border, and also with no more deaths on the U.S.-Mexico border, which established water stations in the harsh Sonoran desert, desert where hundreds of refugees were perishing. Border police were, quote, embarrassed, unquote, by no more deaths actions and then took over operation of, the, of those stations. Our second speaker will be Robert Herbst, Herbst Esquire, um, who's a human rights lawyer working with ICAD, the International Coalition Against um, House Demolitions um, uh, uh, and Jewish Voice for Peace. He's a human rights lawyer in New York City and a member of the Westchester, New York chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace or JVP. He's been speaking and writing on Israel-Palestine since Operation Protective Edge in Gaza in 2014. Bob sometimes jokes that when he was the coordinator of JVP Westchester, they could not gain entry into Jewish congregations since they didn't want to hear from this work. Um, so we'll be hearing more about that shortly. Our third speaker will be Runbir Sirkepkani um, from uh, Lesbos, Greece, who is a Kurdish activist working with Christian peacemaker teams and also the Aegean Migrant Solidarity Program. Runbir as one of the world's 30 million plus Kurds is stateless, essentially born in Iraq and granted citizenship by Sweden. He uses his deep connection to and solidarity with refugees fleeing war-torn areas to welcome them when they arrive by boat in Lesbos, Greece and assist them in seeking sanctuary. Our fourth speaker will be Chrissy Stonebreaker Martinez based in Cleveland, Ohio in the United States who is co-director of the Interreligious Task Force on Central America and holds many, many other hats, including as national co-chair of FOR USA. Chrissy is a Colombian American who lives in Cleveland, as I said, the lands of the Algonquin, Iroquois, and Suyan speaking peoples. While spending time with grandparents in Colombia for their quinceanera, they witnessed someone calling out for their mother after being left by paramilitaries to die. Since then, they've decided to speak truth to power, fight for families, heighten the contradictions of oppression, and push back against the cognitive dissonance that comes from living in the belly of the beast of imperialism. Welcome, Chrissy. 
Our fifth speaker will be Maglaha Hama, a Polisario uh, in the Polisario refugee camps in Tindouf, Algeria. She is a Western Sahara refugee and, a, and an activist at NOVA, or the Nonviolence Association of the Western Sahara. Maglaha was born and raised in a refugee camp in the Sahara Desert. Her commitment to the peaceful tenets of Islam as the means to pursue the liberation of the Western Sahara has led her to speak internationally about the Sahrawi liberation struggle and women's empowerment. Welcome, Maglaha. Our final speaker on today's panel is Brian Terrell, who is an activist in the Catholic Worker Movement, the Ban Killer Drones Campaign, and Voices for Creative Nonviolence. Raised a nominal Catholic, Brian's faith formation began in earnest in 1975 when he joined the Catholic Worker and as a teenager met Dorothy Day. As a young woman, Dorothy asked, where were the saints to try to change the social order, not just to minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery? Unquote. A question that she didn't find well answered in institutional religion. Brian has taken that question to heart and has spent three years incarcerated internationally in efforts to change the social order. We also regret that one of our uh, planned panelists was unable to attend today's webinar, but she will, like most of our panelists today, be participating in October in the In-Person Peace Congress. That's Carlene Griffith Seku, who is executive director of the Dignity Project International, who will be speaking as a part of this uh, workshop and panel in Barcelona about the movement for black lives, homelessness in the United States as a form of domestic forced migration and much more. So uh, before I turn it back over now, I think to Susan, I wanna just note once again and encourage all of you our attendees, thank you again for joining us from across the world. Please do share your name, your place, your uh, other, everything you want to share in the chat. And please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during the course of the, uh, the program to direct questions to our panelists and to us as a whole. Susan, let me turn it back over to you now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ethan. And I'm gonna turn it right over to Reverend Bob Brashear. Uh, Reverend Bob, if you could please tell us a bit about yourself, your work, its connection to sanctuary. Uh, Bob, we can't hear you. Unmute. All right. My name is uh, Reverend Bob Rashir. I am a uh, Presbyterian pastor in New York City. I live in Harlem and I've been a pastor for uh, the last, oh, 40 some years. Uh, my work in uh, international just migration comes as part of my commitment as a person of faith to building a more just, humane, inclusive, and sustainable world. Shortly, shortly after dawn in October 1992, my friend John Fife and I went out to meet the student volunteers who would go out every morning to photograph that day's harvest of mutilated bodies dumped after another night of terror in the ongoing massacre, genocide of the poor carried out by the death squads of the United States supported Salvadoran regime. The photos would then be taken and had to be taken before sanitation crews removed the bodies for disposal. The photos would then be kept at the diocese office and were the only way that families could find out what had happened to their disappeared loved ones. We were in El Salvador on behalf of the Presbyterian Church, seeking to understand what was causing so many Salvadorans to risk their lives crossing the deadly Sonoran Desert to come to the United States. John had become involved because one morning there was a knock on his door and someone was there seeking shelter. When he heard their story, John opened the doors of the church and inspired by an ancient tradition whereby fugitives fleeing for their lives could claim respite and protection within the doors of the church, the sanctuary movement was born. 
In the next year, I would go to Arizona and travel with John. Okay. Uh, sorry, we had an issue there with videos for some reason. Okay. All right. In the next year, I would go to Arizona and travel with John across the border to visit refugee detainees in a Nogales, Mexico jail. Once even encountering someone I'd met in a Salvadoran prison. And then we would facilitate and accompany one of these pilgrims across the border to a safe haven on the other side. For this work, John would later be arrested by the United States government and be convicted. He was very proud to be the elected moderator of the Presbyterian Church, and in his language, to be the first convicted felon to be elected moderator of the Presbyterian Church USA. It's been an ongoing struggle to uh, combat the criminalization of humanitarian response to those who are seeking asylum. In 2007, I was visiting Berlin with a group of clergy from New York City. We were meeting with Pastor Jürgen Quant at the Heilige Kreuz Church to learn of their work with asylum seekers. Pastor Jürgen described how their work had begun by responding to Palestinian refugees from the Lebanese Civil War in the 80s. I told him that it reminded me of the work that we had done with Central Americans during those years, and he responded, well, that's where we got the idea. I knew then that it was important for those involved in this work on both sides of the ocean to meet one another. One year later, with the help of the Halbrook Foundation and the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the Stony Point Center, church asylum workers from Germany traveled to Arizona to meet with their colleagues from No Mas Huertos, No More Deaths, and other groups involved in sanctuary work. A year later, a return visit to Germany would take place. We began to understand the parallels between the life-threatening realities of the Sonoran Desert and the Mediterranean Sea for those risking their lives seeking asylum. After a few years hiatus, the resurgent world migration crisis led us to come together again, made easier by the emergent global communications technologies. In 2016, our group produced the International Sanctuary Declaration. It had two main purposes. The first was to arrive at a common set of principles for those engaged in this work. The other was to begin a process of advocacy that could result in internationally recognized protocols for just migration. I'd like to say a little bit more in detail now about the statement. We were setting forth five principles that could be used to guide grassroots and governmental responses to the global escalation of displacement. As you heard earlier, it's in conformity and solidarity with the United States Convention relating to the status of refugees from 1951. And it states the following. We express our deep concern for the well-being of the refugee children, families, and all migrants currently arriving at our borders, as well as those struggling to live within our borders. In response to the increased numbers of people around the world who are being forced to leave their home countries and the simultaneous increase in punitive enforcement in many receiving countries, we affirm the following principles to guide and inspire our efforts to respond. First, compassionate response. We care deeply about refugee children, families, and all migrants. We urge our countries to have open arms to protect them and preserve their human dignity. We reject detention of migrants as a violation of human rights and dignity. Due process. We advocate for fair and timely legal proceedings, competent legal representation, and due process for children asylum seekers and all migrants. Family unity, we uphold and respect the unity of families as a basic human right. Restorative justice, we desire revitalization and healing of our borderlands, not militarization. The only long-term solution is a holistic approach that prioritizes safety and opportunity for migrants and addresses root causes. Civil initiative, as long as our governments are not adequately addressing these humanitarian crises, citizens have the right and responsibility to respond with an approach that follows the mandate to provide sanctuary when needed, and above all, to love our neighbors. 
Based on these principles, we covenant with one another to work together for just and humane response to all migrants, both at our borders and within our countries. We call on our governments and the governments of all countries and receiving migrants in response to the current and ongoing international humanitarian and refugee crises to embrace these principles. Bob, thank you. Reverend Bob, thank you so very much. I, I, I would like to just say a little bit about uh, my, my own faith. Very briefly. Yes, please. Later that year, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church would endorse this statement, as well as many other faith-based organizations. Today, we have an ever-expanding work group of participants from the US, Canada, Mexico, Europe, and Africa who are involved in the front line of just migration work. Another round of visits would begin in 2018 with representatives from our expanding circle. And our last visit took place in November 2019 to Tucson, Nogales, El Paso, Juarez, and Stony Point, New York. I come to this work as one who seeks to follow Jesus. My tradition finds inspiration in our commonly held Hebrew scriptures, or Old Testament, and the Christian New Testament. Throughout the five books of the Torah, law or better teaching, there is a constant call, consistent call, to care for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger at your gate. For example, Deuteronomy 10.18. At the very center of the Torah, with as many verses before as after, is this verse from Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the verse that when Jesus was asked what is the most important commandment, he responded with these words. The most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. There are at least 18 variations of this quote in the Bible. In my reformed tradition, we understand ourselves to have a responsibility for the stewardship of creation. That work is guided by a vision of shalom, a peace that is not simply the absence of violence, but a wholeness, including justice. But for me, faith is not proof texting or assent to the theological propositions. It is a way of being, a life lived. For me, this struggle for just immigration is a basic expression of faith. However, it's more than an expression of faith. It's an expression of being human. For the story of humanity is the story of people on the move. Everything from the texture of our hair, to the color of our skin, to the words we speak, the food we eat, the religions we practice, are the result of people in motion encountering one another, and for the most part, people in motion not of their own original choosing. People in motion coming together. There is no language, culture, or religion that is pure. The stream is ever flowing, and unique particularities come together only for their own season, ready to make their own contribution to the stream, which then flows on. We are all part of what AI Weiwei has called the human flow. And as part of humanity, we have a responsibility to see that that human flow continues with as much compassion, humaneness, and justice as possible. That is our calling, and that is our work. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much, Bob, for sharing that and uh, also to the Presbyterian Church uh, USA, which uh, was pioneering in its sanctuary uh, principles and work. And I've put in the chat the link uh, for folks to look at the International Sanctuary Declaration Statement. And uh, we welcome your organizations to endorse. And um, we will hold off questions for Bob to the end. At this point, we're going to move on to um, uh, Robert Herbst, and Bob is uh, with Jewish Voice for Peace. And Bob, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your work as it relates not to sanctuary per se, but more to uh, refugee rights and specifically Palestinians. Thank you, Susan uh, and Ethan and Reverend Emma and our sponsors, uh, FOR USA, the International Sanctuary Declaration Network, and the International Peace Bureau for putting together this webinar. And it's truly an honor for me to be on a panel with these remarkable activists who are truly doing God's work around the world. 
I, I was asked to speak for seven minutes about the cataclysmic state of the world and our relationship to saving it, including a, a bio of my work, how it relates to uh, Israel, Palestine, Jews, and Palestinians. And of course, that's uh, an impossible task. So all I'm going to say about my bio, at least for now, is that I'm a human rights lawyer in the United, uh, uh, in the United States, we usually say civil rights lawyer. And I'm a member of the board of ICAD uh, USA, the Committee Against Home Demolitions in Palestine, and a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, or JVP, both of which support Palestinian liberation and the call of Palestinian civil society for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS, to pressure Israel to shed its apartheid-like domination and oppression of the Palestinian people and to accord a full measure of self-determination, equal rights, human dignity, and the right of return to both peoples. About saving the world, I first want to say that before one goes about uh, saving it, one has to try to understand it, why its state is cataclysmic, beset by existential threats from climate change, weapons of mass destruction, poverty, greed, untrammeled corporate capitalism, huge inequality of rights and resources, and so forth. <clears throat> and while uh, we heard from Susan that uh, Martin identified militarism, poverty, and racism as the three main evils of society, I think he may too narrowly have circumscribed the third. I would enlarge it and call it tribalism. Tribalism underlies the first two evils and is the root and source of most of our other problems, existential or not. I was helped in my understanding of this by the remarkable evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson, who in 2013 wrote a book called The Social Conquest of Earth, a major thesis of which is that we've evolved in two irreconcilable ways. <clears throat> to be tribal, that is to privilege ourselves, our family, our clan, our village, our state, our nation, our caste, our race, our co-religionists on the one hand, and to be what he called altruistic, by which he means to conceive ourselves and act, and really act, as members of one global species living in one global commons on one planet Earth. And Wilson says that these conflicting evolutionary instincts are the source of most of our conflicts, both external and internal. And that if we do not quickly evolve definitively in the direction of altruism, we and our civilization, our way of life will probably not survive. So I fundamentally conceive of my work and our work essentially to do everything we can to encourage our fellow human beings to evolve more quickly in the direction of altruism over tribalism in everything we do, which brings me to uh, Jews and Palestinians. <clears throat> I'm a member of the Jewish tribe. And I first went to Israel in 1969 where I was uncomfortable with the nationalistic fervor that was accentuated by the Six Day War in 1967, two years before, which has only gotten worse with time. I was uncomfortable about it, but I didn't make it a major priority. I didn't speak up outside the tribe <coughs> about the oppression of Palestinians. That changed in 2014, as Susan uh, or Ethan mentioned, <coughs> one year after Wilson's book was published with the horrific brutality of Israel's Operation Protective Edge in Gaza. That obscenity moved me to start really educating myself about the facts on the ground, how oppressive and challenging Palestinian life really is under the Israeli fist, and not just in the refugee camps, but in all of Gaza, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and even for Palestinian citizens of Israel who lack uh, equal rights. And I started learning about the real history of Zionism and Israel's history of ethnic cleansing. And I started speaking up. And in doing so, I've left some blood on the floor in my relations with some friends and relatives who think that I'm out of line, not tribal enough, not supportive enough of Israel and the Jewish people. That's part of the evil of tribalism and how it silences our instincts for justice. Jews and Palestinians are Semitic brothers and sisters. 
but one tribe dominates the other, rules over the other. Palestinians are now the largest refugee group in the world, seven million victims of a Jewish settler colonial society established when colonialism was supposed to be dying. It has all the problems that white African or apartheid society had in South Africa and worse. Israel, if one were to sum it up, is a regime, a regime of, by, and for Jews, but it is not Jewish. No Jewish person schooled in the universal moral and religious teachings of Judaism could possibly countenance, facilitate, and support the apartheid domination of the Palestinian Arab people with majority indigenous population when Israel was created. This is a huge cognitive dissonance. There is a huge cognitive dissonance between the oppression of Palestinians by Israeli Jews supported primarily by the United States and the religious teachings of Judaism and the democratic principles of American democracy. And more and more American Jews are beginning to feel this cognitive dissonance as the Palestinian narrative has started to break through Israeli Hasbara propaganda in the mainstream American media. Recent polls show that 25% of all Jewish voters 38% of the 40 believe that Israel is an apartheid state. That's a substantial increase in those numbers and it provides a glimmer of hope for those of all faiths who have supported Palestinian liberation, seemingly without much success here in the United States in the last few decades. We know what the solutions are to the Palestinian refugee problem and the wider problem of apartheid in Israel-Palestine, now that the two-state solution is dead. The solution is one democratic state for two peoples, providing a full and equal measure of rights, resources, and dignity to all inhabitants with the right of return for Palestinians as well as Jews. Getting there will require altruism to triumph over tribalism. It's a big ask, a big reach, since we currently lack a global politics equal to the task, which is in my view, the next big subject worthy of discussion. Um, how am I doing on time? You're doing great, Bob, and thank you so much. Um, and, and the framing of this in terms of tribalism is very uh, interesting and certainly with ramifications in different parts of the world. And I'm thinking of, for example, our, our, our friend Arunbir, uh, who's Kurdish, and the, there are uh, 30, 40 million Kurdish people in five different countries. And, and then the issue of tribalism, yet we are one human family. Um, before moving on to Runbir, I, I want to ask you, and I know this is a trick question, a little bit of a loaded question, because you've described yourself to me as uh, somewhat secular, but, but how has or has Judaism inspired your brave work, and in particular in a, in a community like Westchester in New York City, where, where you get an abs absolutely great amount of pushback for supporting Palestinian rights? Well, you know, having been a, a civil rights lawyer and both a prosecutor and a criminal defense lawyer these last 48 years, and having been witness to the full panoply of human good and evil, right and wrong. I think that faith sometimes is, in the words of the psychiatrist in the movie Ordinary People that came out decades ago, a tough nut. Because God doesn't show much of his face in today's world, and things are deteriorating at a rapid clip. And when we talk about, we use the phrase, save the world, which when I was growing up, people, people used to, to really say, well, I'm interested in, in social justice. But now it's real. Now we really do have to save the world. And so I've chosen to put my faith in the universal moral and religious teachings of both Judaism and the great secular democratic, economic, social, and legal thinkers in the last uh, few hundred years. And I, I tend to put my faith more in establishing a kingdom of law than a kingdom of faith on earth, although I recognize the need for faith as a motivating factor for those men and women of goodwill who also believe in these common universal tenets that motivate us here. And I think that politics 
is the most neglected of the legal arts to which we must all rededicate ourselves. Because as Noam Chomsky said in that video, if you look at most of the existential problems that can destroy us as a civilization, from climate change, the weapons of mass destruction, all the other things we saw in that brief video, pandemics, global health, poverty, flight of refugees, they're not really environmental problems or scientific or medical problems. They are political problems more than anything else because we don't have a global politics equal to the task of coming to make global decisions in these areas and implement uh, the solutions in a legitimate, accountable, democratic way other than by unanimity. Because we still think of ourselves as a member of one, uh, uh, you know, one family, one village, one religion, one nation, rather than, than one unified people. And to me, that's the fundamental problem of our age. We are still mired in an age of nationalism. You know, our founders in revolutionary America realized that a confederation of 13 states in which unanimity was required to make decisions about the revolutionary war debt or imposing custom duties couldn't work. And those problems pale in comparison to the global, global problems that can literally kill us today. <clears throat> in two years, they figured out how to exchange a confederacy for a federal union, which with some notable uh, exceptions like today served us well, because it permitted a nation of 50 states to make decisions by majority rule in a way that's perceived to be legitimate by the great majority of Americans. Whether we Americans can keep that union is a struggle we're fighting today, but when it comes to global political institutions, we're still back in that revolutionary era of hundreds of years ago, and we need to evolve much more quickly and create a global politics that's up to the tasks that face us. Thank you, Bob. And uh, what you've just offered is actually a great segue to our next speaker, uh, Rundir Sekopkani, um, who is Kurdish, and uh, also to lift up the fact that um, Abdullah Ojolan, who is um, the head of the Kurdish People's uh, Party, has been incarcerated for over 20 years now for espousing the very uh, ideas, uh, idealistic ideas about confederation, democracy, uh, yeah, pushing beyond borders to communities and uh, peaceful uh, living uh, amongst each other. Um, but he is labeled by um, the United States and Turkey as a terrorist for uh, ostensibly uh, trying to push against the, the borders of the modern nation state to peacefully accommodate uh, 40 million Kurds. Uh, so with that, thank you, um, Runbir, welcome. Thank you so much. I feel very honored to be in this space uh, with, uh, with my Jewish and Christian and uh, other brothers and sisters. Uh, so I want to uh, begin my, uh, so I, I am from Iraqi Kurdistan uh, in order for everyone to like uh, 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 to be able to place me on a map, I grew up hearing that we are a stateless uh, nation, and we um, uh, we are uh, occupied by four countries and all these things, and this is how we are known as Kurds. I think I'm not ashamed of being stateless. I'm not ashamed of uh, not belonging to a nation state uh, like others. I think that the earth deserves better than nation states. I grew up uh, in a community uh, which was self, uh, self like resilient and sustainable. Uh, we, uh, we were half nomadic, we were, uh, uh, we were doing agriculture. The only thing we bought from town was like rice and tea. And then I witnessed the destruction of my community and our lifestyle with my own eyes. I was born 1984 and 
like the, 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 in that year, the genocide against my community uh, started and the Iraqi government killed uh, 182,000 people in the Alpha Anfal campaign. And like, they, they also tried many different weapons uh, on my community. I, come, I also want to honor, like, I'm not only a Kurd, I would say I'm a Jew, I'm an Arab, I am all the people who come from that area, from Zagros Mountains, I'm from Mesopotamia. Uh, I'm the son of Tigris and Euphrates, I'm the son of the great and the small Zab, and also the small river in the valley where I come from. Uh, so the, in the village of my grandfather, there was a, a Jewish community. And also in, my, in the village where I was born, there was a Jewish community. And they were expelled in the 19, uh, like in the 1950s by the anti-Semitic and pro-Nazi Iraqi government and in collaboration with the Zionist government of Israel. And they were taken to Israel to be put in, um, to be put in uh, tents and being like still their descendants are, uh, are, are uh, the second and the third great citizens of, of Israel. I also come from a community that have been under occupation and also been divided for uh, like 100, like 500 years now. We were before the, the, the birth of the nation states of Iraq, Iran and, uh, and, and Turkey and Syria, we were divided by the Persian and the Ottoman empires. And my village is close to the border. So my whole life have been formed by those borders. And like in my father's, my grandfather's and his, his grandfather's generations, my community and Mesopotamia and Zagros mountains have lost its diversity. Uh, by means of genocide, by means of forced displacement, and by means of colonialism. Uh, and we, believe, we, we live in a reality now, like for instance, like I, I, I grew up in a, in a valley which was uh, only Muslim and Shafi'i. Uh, 150 years ago, there were Ezidis in my valley and they were Jews. And now we don't have them anymore because they, they were all killed off uh, and, and, and displaced. And I feel that I have always grown up, of course, like with the, with the awareness that we are under occupation, but I've also grown up feeling that there is something missing because my, gra my grandmother was talking about the Jews who were there, but I never met any Jews. So uh, when it comes to like, what's making me to engage myself in saving the world, I would say like, who am I to save the world? Uh, I think if we continue doing what we are doing, we are just gonna shoot ourselves in the foot and we are gonna, we need to save ourselves as a species. If we continue with this division and with the, the self-destructive behaviors, that we are doing. If we will uh, keep uh, letting the rich to take from the poor, we will all die, but probably the rich will survive more than us. So, uh, and also what gives me like, I, 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 also, I, I think that we should be bold in our resistance to defend our earth and to defend the, uh, the diversity of life and the diversity of the human family, but we should also be humble because who are we to save the world? We have been always told to, uh, like by 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 different by by the different sta nation states and and other oppressive uh, structures that we are too small uh, to act and to defend our dignity. Uh, but we have also seen in our own small lives that that's not true and every individual act 
in defense of Earth and all the diversity of, of Earth is worth it. Uh, sorry, did you want to ask something? Uh, Runbir, I'd like to hear, and I, I think um, people uh, in the audience would like to hear how your faith has inspired you to do the work that you do. And uh, you and I, when we talked before, uh, you mentioned that um, you had actually uh, for some time moved away from Islam and understandably so, uh, seeing so many uh, Muslim leaders behaving like tyrants and behaving horribly. Uh, but that uh, actually your faith and the faiths of many peoples, whether it be the Yazidis or uh, Christians or Jewish, like you are inspired by so many faiths. So how does your faith uh, inspire your work? And in particular, you, you moved to Sweden and now are working with Christian peacemaker teams in the Igerian, uh, Aegean Migrant uh, Solidarity Program in, in Lesbos. So I, uh, I moved away from, uh, because like the, the, it, the, where I come from, uh, the, uh, the, the, the way that the faith uh, was practiced and also uh, promoted by the Saudi-funded uh, uh, Wahhabi mullahs. Uh, for me, it was very oppressive, and I didn't want to be a part of that anymore. So I rebelled against, like I, my whole journey began with like rebelling against uh, what I know as Islam. Uh, and then I was calling myself an atheist for many, many years. And well, I was never an atheist, but like, if you rebelled against Islam, you had to become an atheist in my community. So uh, I met many people and also like I have always been inspired by many different faiths, uh, Ezidism, Yarsanism, which are like the traditional indigenous uh, faiths uh, in Iraqi, in Iraqi Kurds and also like among Kurds in general, and also like by the other Islam that my mother is Islam, you know, and the stories in Quran, like I have always, I have kept reading Quran, I have kept reading Bible, I have kept reading like uh, different uh, like books from different faith traditions. And also when I engaged in CPT, I encountered like the indigenous resistance uh, much closer. And, and it actually like made me feel that maybe I am more an animist, of course, in inspired by Islam, of course, inspired by the faith from my community. Like, like the indigenous way of thinking uh, re really resembled of like the way I was growing up because we are the indigenous people of the Zagros mountains and of the Mesopotamian uh, plain. So this kind of like, it, it, my faith, like, like I also like say that I'm the son of the rivers. For me, the liberation of the rivers, the liberation of water is very important because since the foundation of the nation states of Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iraq, the Tigris and Euphrates, the big Zab and the, and the great Zab and the small Zab have never been let to flow freely. And now people are being without water, desertification is spreading because of all the big dams that they are uh, building in Turkey, Syria, and Iran. So uh, like a lot of like people are saying that um, the American occupation of Iraq is the big cause of, of like the like the beginning of ISIS and other extremists. Like, it's like the anger of being left without water is the main cause for why people rebel against the, uh, the, the state of Iraq and everything else that supported it. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, also speaking of water and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the Kurdish people and the, from what I understand, the Yazidis are the original Kurds are the descendants of Noah. And uh, so your, your history ancestrally goes back to a time where there were no borders. Borders are violence, borders are colonialism. And the freedom of Kurds and the communities of the Zagros Mountains of Mesopotamia is dependent on the abolition of the nation states and all the other oppressive structures that have pushed us down and destroyed our land and water. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you so much, Runbir. 
I'm going to uh, pass it now to Chrissy Stonebreaker Martinez uh, from the Interreligious Task Force on Central America, um, who is always doing direct action and even recently regarding water uh, violation here in the US. Chrissy, uh, welcome. Thank you. And how I follow up Roombeer, I'm not sure, but um, Roombeer, you inspire me from afar every single day and you and our shared communities are on my heart every single day. Thank you so much. And I want to just keep going with what you were just talking about because it's uh, important to me and I'm uh, very passionate about um, being border free and uh, creating a world and heightening the contradictions that um, that the nation states that we're living under have uh, created for us. So I wanna share a little bit about, um, about bo what border free means to me that I learned from a community member here uh, where I'm calling from in Cleveland, uh, Dr. John Flores, an immigration and Mexican labor history um, scholar. <clears throat> and he says that borderless is a reminder it reminds us that a borderless world currently exists for corporations, powerful governments, and the rich. Corporations circle the globe in search of natural resources, consumers, and laborers. Governments establish military bases outside of their sovereign territories, and especially my government in the United States, which has the most um, military bases of anyone, anywhere, um, hundreds, in fact, um, more than any other uh, nation states combined. And the, the next highest three are France um, the U and the UK and other former colonial powers. So that's an aside, let's get back to Dr. Flores. Um, the governments establish military bases outside of their sovereign, uh, sovereign territories and the rich possess the means to move. So conversely, the working class people live in a parallel reality. Every day, thousands of working people migrate across international borders in search of living wage work, and their journeys are made perilous by the borders that divide the world into the rich and the poor. And we're seeing that today in um, Central America. We're seeing that today in Afghanistan. We're seeing that today um, in too many places, right? The borders in our world are designed to deprive. Walls and military forces create artificial scarcity and enclose resources for some at the expense of others, while ideological borders divide us, keep us from seeing ourselves in the faces of our migrating siblings. Despite these barriers, people are banding together to create alternatives, and that's what we're trying to do here today and inspire other people to do here today as well, right? And, um, and this is really important. And we know that it's been really important for a really long time. I wanna share another, I'm gonna share a lot uh, of myself, but I'm also gonna share a lot of the people who have um, taught me and brought me to where I am today. Uh, Franz Fanon, in the wretched of the earth said to educate the masses politically does not mean and cannot mean making a political speech like I'm doing here now. <laughs> what it means is to try relentlessly and passionately and you will hear it in my voice to teach the masses that everything depends on them. That's us. That if we stagnate, it is their resp responsibility our responsibility. And then if we go forward, it is due to them too. It is up to us to win, right? It is our duty. Um, and that there is no such thing as a demiurge, that there is no famous man or woman who will, or person who will take the responsibility for everything. But that demiurge is the people themselves. And the magic hands are finally only the hands of the people. I am, um, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, myself. Um, yes, I work as the co-director of the Interreligious Task Force on Central America and Colombia. Um, I am displaced from my indigenous homelands where the Embedda peoples uh, continue to live today <laughs> in Medellin and Antioquia. 
And the parts of me that society sees as not indigenous are parts that were stolen from me by settler colonialism, violent settler colonialism. And still, I am grateful um, to people who teach me to love uh, and, and defend my neighbor, regardless of the fact, regardless of whether or not my neighbor hates me. So I come from oral traditions, traditions more fit to adapt for the purposes of survival. I believe deeply in the divine. I believe deeply in humble people who help others uh, learn their legacy. And to, part of our legacy is honoring our ancestors and protecting our children for seven generations from now. I believe deeply in the magic of nature and of silence. And I've had many different religious traditions um, projected onto me because of the place that I live, because of the history of, um, of settler colonialism, and also because of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the um, NCPT and other um, organizations that we get to be in partnership with, that we have the honor and privilege of stewarding relationships with, um, I've been able to see, much like Rumbir, uh, the, the beauty in um, the diversity in all, of our, in all of our religious traditions. And I believe that there's magic in all of these traditions. I believe in sanctuary for all and a border-free world. I believe in life and liberation. And I'm going to come back to that. I am an abolitionist. Um, I am an abolitionist, uh, and I can say it clearly, partly because of um, Miss Jordan Simpson, uh, Reverend Dr. Jordan Simpson, and her amazing children, um, including Candace and uh, my co-chair, Erin uh, Goggins. I am an abolition because of their teachings and because I am sick and tired of seeing my government my tax dollars, my neighbors use to uphold systems of death and decay for profit. I believe in life and liberation. And so I'm wanting my neighbors to learn how to support and defend each other, learn how to support and defend um, and defend each other so that we can uphold systems of life and liberation. And I have faith, thanks to my uh, Native elders, um, I am told I must have faith. More than hope, I must have faith that we will relearn how to respect our Mother Earth and rematriate in the ways that we need to to keep our um, our divine uh, our divine systems um, going, if you will. Uh, I want to share one more person's. Um, uh, yearning really quick, and that's Adrienne Marie Brown. She re recently um, she recently wrote uh, Darwin of the uh, Darwin variant, um, uh, a play on the Delta variant, and talking about um, the fittest surviving through love rather than through ableism. And this part um, is something that I've been yearning to, and that resonated with me. And that was, I feel empathy for those who don't trust the government even as I feel my own righteous distrust. And I have a lot of that distrust because I've been detained for my activism and, um, and I know that I have suffered um, much less than many others. But what's been helping me in this moment is how much I love the divine work of science, she says. I believe that the sacred force that designed hummingbirds and eagles and the symbiosis of bees and flowers and the desalinization of the ocean through vapor and rain also moves through the minds of our scientists. I feel a primal longing for more people to trust in the curiosity-based practice of science. I feel a political need for science to be decoupled from big pharma, which feels so close to how I need movements to be decoupled from big philanthropy. But currently it's all the same tangled rope of innovation and struggle and funding to which we cling over 
uh, an apocalyptic abyss. I'm not trying to be dramatic here. I'm just trying to say what it is. Um, I do uh, participate in direct action and I'm feeling called to get closer and closer and closer to home. The pandemic has been a portal and all crises are a crossroads. They are an opportunity for us to move differently, to learn from our histories. And so here we are, we've been in an almost 20 month uh, crossroads, um, some of us longer, nearly two years of crossroads. And we see uprisings all around us and we see the world literally on fire. And yet we know we're still not doing enough. We're just struggling to get by. We're just struggling to meet our budgets. We're just struggling to take risks. But when we take risks together, we build trust. And when we build trust, we know that our power is more bold, more beautiful, and more um, successful. When we come together as people with the people power that we know we can harness within us. So um, I'll leave it at that. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Chrissy. We're gonna uh, reserve uh, questions toward the end. Um, and um, we've allotted 10 minutes and you've shared so much, but before moving on, uh, could you uh, clarify what your faith tradition traditions are? And, uh, you know, particularly in this day and age when uh, uh, larger uh, religious institutions have been co-opted and coupled with exploitation, if you could just briefly share what, what your faith faiths are and how you're inspired. Yeah, so I was trying to get a little bit at that. Um, I believe in, um, I am an agnostic theist. I believe in the divine uh, very deeply. And I don't know exactly what tradition is, quote unquote, the right one. I was um, raised in um, the Protestant tradition. And uh, my mother was raised in the Catholic tradition. And both of those traditions, I see them as um, settler colonial religions. And the reason why my, um, my different and vastly, and more vast I guess a uh, view of religion and faith and spirituality is, um, is so important to me is because the religion of my faith, of, of my community, my family, my ancestors was able to survive amidst that settler colonial religion. Um, so I can find great inspiration from Jesus and the disciples from the prophet Muhammad um, and from others that we have um, that we have understood to be prophets. Uh, and I, and because I was raised in the Protestant tradition, I was raised in Disciples of Christ in UCC churches. I feel that they have a responsibility to keep putting up with me. Um, and I have a responsibility to uh, keep pulling them along um, regardless of if all of our um, beliefs are totally aligned. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Chrissy. And uh, I'll just add that it's always inspiring for me, uh, working for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, to have you on our National Council as co-chair as co and uh, uh, leading our way. So with this transition, uh, we're going to go over now to Maglaha Hama. And uh, Maglaha is uh, a refugee born and raised in the refugee camps of uh, the Western Sahara. And unlike um, most of the panelists, she's going to speak from a vantage point of uh, being someone who has been given sanctuary by uh, the Algerian government. And also um, what makes something, uh, what's remarkable about the Sahrawi people is their absolute quest for nonviolence. So welcome, welcome Nakamaha. Thank you so much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and hello everybody. Are you hearing me clear? Because- Yes, we hear you clear. And just to, to let folks know, um, 
we're we're not going to maybe you could show your face for just a moment but because the the internet connection is very unstable in the western sahara um yes yes sorry i cl take close long time close the camera because the voice go on back for uh, speakers before me and i necessarily close the camera because i uh, hear very clear okay great so <laughs> Okay, so, um, we'll listen to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry for offering the camera again because you clear me. Or <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm happy uh, today because I participate with you in big event with uh, Bob and Robert and everyone. And I'm so happy to hear your story and hear your work. Uh, I to the, uh, today I will be talk about uh, about the life of refugee camp and how the Sahrawi resist about the peaceful way. Uh, my name is Baghla Hama. I'm from Mustafa Sahara. Live like uh, Susan and uh, told uh, in a refugee camp in Algeria. Western Sahara was occupied by the Moroccan in 1975 until today. Uh, the Sahara people live a very difficult life of a refuge. Despite Algeria, we are help, uh, they help and the humanitarian support for us. And uh, however, the suffering of refuge and the relate of the desert climate is very difficult. Because like this summer, uh, the degree 15 degree today. And in the occupied areas of Western Sahara, the risk life is people and the violence, oppress, ament, and the forced disappearance, violence, and also beating of the Sahrawi women in the street by the Moroccan police to prevent their to prevent the peaceful demonstration and uh, experience of the opinion. <coughs> Moroccan is playing the, the natural research and working to deep the colonialism. Colonism is the spirit of the suffering, the longest of the occupation and inaction of the international community and the Security Council who give the right of the Sahrawi people, the right of self-demonstration, because we, we need to take the self-demonstration in 1991, but not uh, the Security Council uh, and international society not take us this right. The Sahrawis continued the struggle in this field war, give that, Give that the, the word the Muslim society and not violence group like this Daesh, like the Taliban, like this uh, other the uh, Qaeda in North Africa. We don't have any Sahrawi continue the group violence. We sit the peace had immigrated in us group. We just uh, take the group organization like my organization Nova. This organization work in nonviolence. We are working to spread the culture of nonviolence and peace through the dialogue. We attempt to promote it the formation for youth, women, and children. And children. We also, the, uh, despite the difficult way, face at the beginning, the work was not easy. Wait, sorry. Sorry, my mind is dark, the main door. Uh, we just uh, split difficult, we face it at the beginning. The work was not easy because the idea of nonviolence was not clear to people here. But after a lot of the successful work, we will be able to go to find this, this, uh, this find it. Yes, we also still the work to share the violence, non-violence here in the refugee camp. Also the people here, the simple people help us and support us to share this culture. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, Susan, sorry, I not to hear you. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. You know, um, uh, what is really truly remarkable about the Sahrawi people, and this is after more than 45 years of brutal mil military occupation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and even last year, this was exa exacerbated by the United States unilaterally recognizing um, Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara, which is illegal and uh, illegitimate and it yes. has no right to do. And in spite of this, I mean, I think uh, this is an irony, but but it's it's a beautiful testimony to the nonviolent nature of the Sahrawi people who are, yeah. are Muslims, um, that in spite of, of all of that, we one reason why people never don't know about the situation in the Western Sahara is precisely because we don't hear of any violence coming from that region, at least from the Sahrawi people. There's, yeah. there, there is not terrorism, there is not, uh, uh, you know, to the north, east, uh, west, and south of the Western Sahara, we, we hear of Islamic terrorism in places where empire, US empire, European empire uh, subjugates and oppresses people. So uh, before moving on to our uh, final speaker, Brian, could you share for you as a Muslim, what is it about your faith that inspires you to cling tightly to the rope of peace when the world is, is betraying you for years and years? Yes, thank you for your question. All the people Sahrawi here Muslim, we just have religion, Islam. Because Islam is religion of love and peace, we are believe that. It taught us to respect other and not kill. Never Sahrawi kill other or other people. And ups the person, but rather to Islamic is a religion, and the other, like the Surat al Ma'un. I will be read the Surat al Ma'un, and you can please help me into English because uh, I will be read in Arabic. Okay, Susan? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Surat al Ma'un, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحد على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاة مساهون الذين هم يرؤون ويمنعون المعروف Amen that is so beautiful uh, in the name of God the merciful and all compassionate have you seen the one who denies religion that is the one who repulses the orphan harshly and urges not the feeding of the poor. So woe to those hypocrites who perform prayers, but those who do not pray sincerely and they pray only to be seen and prevent small acts of kindness. Thank you so much, Susan. Yes, we understand that Islamic to uh, the group of manner and to love and uh, mercy and other. We take the strategy of nonviolence because Islam is to, uh, to uh, help us in this strategy. I Please take me one minute also. I want to talk about the Algeria. Algeria, <laughs> uh, I'm very sad because of the fires and the discretion of the causes, but I know that, uh, that they are strong people and will be challenged this crisis. Please pray for the sake of Algeria people. Uh, Algeria, Algeria is very a great country and the people who provide us with help and security and failed to touch us food, clothes, schools, and to very good sanctuary and very safely Algeria give us the sanctuary. Algeria was the safe haven, safe heaven for us and the Algerian people, our kids, generous and hospital and welcome us in their land. 
school and home. So the word thank you is very little for them. And thank you so much also. And I hope Algeria still takes them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maklaha. God bless you. God bless the Sahrawi people. God bless, so God bless Algeria. And Shabbat. woe upon uh, countries like the United Arab Emirates, which have dug into the Western Sahara and are exploiting the resources. And it also Shabbat. shows that, again, it's the rich empires that forsake their, their religion, countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So with this lovely segue, we're going to go over to uh, Brian Terrell. Uh, Brian Terrell is um, an activist of many decades. Um, just a small footnote that wasn't in his bio um, to share that he's, he's spent uh, more than, well, we did share actually that he spent more than three years incarcerated internationally in effort to change social order. We're so happy to have you with us, Brian. Mm -hmm. Please, please share with us your work. Uh, thank you, thank you, Susan, and, and all. I, great privilege to 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 be on this panel. Um, yeah, over the, the last uh, forty five years or so, I've had the privilege of being in many of the places where the refugees are coming from: uh, Palestine, Honduras, Guatemala, Chiapas, uh, and more uh, recently. The since two thousand and ten and two thousand eight, I have been visited Afghanistan uh, seven times uh, as the guest of the Afghan peace volunteers for whom a world without borders is, 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 a, is a great goal. Um, as, as Ethan said, where our hearts are with the people in Afghanistan right now. And I know of friends, uh, I have friends who are trying to get to the airport in Afghanistan, in Kabul right now. And I have, uh, many more friends who are in hiding. I have, I know two people who have on foot crossed the border into Pakistan where they are getting uh, temporary and very unsure sanctuary. Uh, but what they need, what well, the people of Afghanistan need more than sanctuary, uh, as much as they need that, they need, they need justice. They need uh, Voices for Care of Nonviolence, a group I worked with for many years has been calling for, for reparations, which is a very, very different concept from foreign aid, which uh, billions and billions has gone uh, in the last, last 20 years into the coffers of US corporations in the name of rebuilt reconstruction and, uh, and foreign aid. Um, what's happening, what's happened in Afghanistan, what's happening today is so predictable. It's so inevitable that, uh, that it has to be, it has to be deliberate, and, and of course it is. It's been said many times that this is a war, uh, twenty years on, and it's not ending. That was never meant to be won. It was never meant to be resolved in any kind of way, but but to, to be con to be to be fostered and continued. It's it's meant to be a war that's that that will that that will last and keep bringing in the dividends. On uh, just talking about. Saudi Arabia and uh, and Yemen, but I think it, I think it's very very apt. Uh, Greg Hayes, who's the CEO of Raytheon, back in January when it appeared that uh, arms sales to Saudi Arabia because of what's happening in Yemen might be might be cut, might be disrupted. Um, he sent a message to the the, the shareholders of Raytheon saying. Uh, look, peace is not gonna break out anytime soon. And he said, it will remain, the Middle East will remain an area of solid growth. We'll see solid growth in the coming years. So reassuring you know, the, the, the greatest uh, fear uh, for this economy, for, for uh, the military industrial complex is, is in the words of the CEO of Raytheon that peace might break out. Um, yeah, the uh, on my visits to Kabul, um, I'm trying to think if I ever met anybody who's a Kabul Kabul native uh, whose family has its roots there, and I can't think that I have. It's a city of millions and millions of internal refugees uh, from all over all over the country, and it's a city that had been of 
couple million before we invaded and is now at six million and even now probably growing. Uh, my last visits there were marked with the sound day and night, a uh, constant clang of metal as pile drivers pushing wells ever deeper where the water table going down, you know, two meters every year. And the mountains around um, Kabul, when I'd visit in the wintertime, the first couple of times, they're, they're covered with snow that would melt and feed the Kabul River and, and the water table with, with climate change, those, 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 the snow does not fall. The rains don't fall. It, it is, you know, it is an emergency and it's an emergency that, that, that has been made and made for the profit of a few. Bob Harps talked about the need of altruism. Um, in 1948, at the end of World War II, uh, George Kennett was a wrote uh, with the State Department, wrote a policy planning study, Foreign Relations of the United States. Uh, at the end of the war, he pointed out that we have 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6% of the, of the population. In the situation we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment, a real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern, relate, pattern of relationships that will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our national security. We will have to dispense with all sentimentality and daydreaming. Our attention will be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. We need not deceive ourselves that we can afford today the luxury of altruism in world ben ben benefaction, we, could see, we should cease to talk about vague and unreal objectives like human rights, raising the standard of, standard of living and democratization. The day is not far off and we're going to have to deal in straight power concepts. Uh, George Kennan has been, uh, you know, he is wildly, widely, praised and held up as an example of, of a hard-headed realist, this person who saw the situation of the world in 1948 and seeing what, what we needed to do in his, uh, you know, to use what, what Bob was talking about with tribalism for, for the sake of our tribe. Um, but we're offered something uh, very, very different in, in as Noam Chomsky put it, um, there is no alternative to making these changes. Um, Greta Thunberg uh, strongly resists being called an ideal, idealist. She said, no, I'm a realist. This is the hard-headed realism that the world needs today. We are not. We who talk about peace and talk about getting rid of borders, uh, talk about justice all over the world. We are not idealists. We are the ones who are the, who are the realists today in, in, our, in our world. Um, yeah, there just simply, you know, there, there, there simply is, is no alternative. There's uh, a world without borders, um, uh, the, you know, the climate change, the climate situation, the, the threat of nuclear weapons today um, is, is very, very dire. Um, and, and, it's a, and we need to make the kind of changes. As has been said, we don't, have, we don't have the political mechanisms in place today to even make them, but, but, but we, have to, we have to do it. And, and this is, this is the, the realism of our situation. Thank you, thank you, uh, Brian. Um, I, I mean, you say this is uh, realism and pragmatism, um, yet uh, somewhere underneath there is faith and spirituality. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, particularly as, as you have learned from the Catholic worker, you are part of the Catholic worker in tradition and have learned from Dorothy Day, uh, Last month, you were uh, uh, protesting uh, nuclear uh, weapons in Germany. And um, this month in, in coming at Creech in Nevada, and then in um, the Netherlands. 
I mean, you state that this is a, a, a matter of practicality and most certainly it is, but could you share also, what is it that calls you to dedicate your life so fully? What in your faith calls, calls you? Well, I think as uh, Cornell West put it, people don't act because they have hope, they have hope because they act. And as you know, Chrissy was saying, I really resonate with it that we, we, you know, we find hope in working with people and, and with the communities that we build. And this goes to, I think, the heart of Catholic worker you know, theology, if you could call it that. It's um, essentially, it sounds ridiculous, but the Catholic worker is, is essentially a contemplative movement. It's not, it's not missionaries. Our, our, our vision comes from uh, you know, Matthew 25, the works of mercy that come from Jesus saying, um, when I was naked you clothed me when i was hungry you fed me when i was a prisoner you visited me uh, when i was homeless you took me in so these works of mercy are not we're not like a lot of other christian groups and trying to spread our religion or trying to um trying to uh convert other people it's it's our own conversion it's our own conversion that we're that we're working toward uh, that these are encounters, these are encounters with God. That when we when we visit a when we visit a prison, uh, whether as a guest or an inmate, or when we visit uh, war zones, when we visit places in our cities uh, where people are hurting, when we visit the sick, we are these are encounters that 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 uh, you know that 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 really are kind of a prayer. And it, and it gives, if we recognize uh, God in the people who are um, uh, all the people of, of Afghanistan, um, the median age is only 18 years old there today, you know, mostly children. If we see them as manifestations of God and not as, uh, as, as, as problems, we're looking at, uh, you know, many good people are looking what's happening there and seeing the problem of, of refugees, but it's, you know, the, the, you know, the problem is ours. The problem is our blindness. I really, I think Dorothy Day would um, really uh, resonate with that, that piece that Maglaha read that, that in Arabic that you translated. Uh, Dorothy said once um, that, uh, the true atheist is the person who does not see God in the poor, regardless of what they what they claim, regardless of the tradition, the faith that they claim, that you know, they're, 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 uh, uh, regardless of their creed. If you don't see that, you don't see God. God is God is present with us, and this this brings a um, uh, you know just like a a religious responsibility. Toward, um, toward the people of Afghanistan, toward the people of Haiti, toward the people of the Western Sahara, uh, people of Colombia, that, that these are uh, uh, not things, not things that we can set aside. Uh, and this, 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 you know, this is our faith. Thank you, thank you so much, Brian. And uh, your calling is certainly an inspiration for us to show up where we can, whenever we can, in solidarity with our, our sisters and brothers, wherever they are. Um, and I, I just want, want to, I, I want to, one more thing, I just want to add uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, Chrissy really reminds me of is that our point in this is to put it in religious terms is we're not trying to be the savior. <laughs> no, the savior is, is in the people and it's in our our community with, with people that we're we're we are we we you know we don't have the solutions but we have to work with people uh, uh and, and when we do that we are we are uh, we are in prayer thank you thank you so much uh, i'm going to turn it over now to ethan and he's going to moderate the q a um we have a number of people who are already posing questions 
and we welcome everyone to uh, use the Q&A function in the, in the bottom of the uh, Zoom, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you all. This has indeed been a wonderful conversation, um, and uh, thank you all for the really um, powerful and poignant um, sharings that you've offered about the work that you do and about your uh, spiritual paths as, as well, which have been really poignant to hear um, that. I think um, I haven't seen um, any specific questions already raised in the chat. I've seen a number of comments. If there are questions, um, please bring them to our attention through the Q&A or um, here. I will say just in response to those who are asking about a recording, we will be making a recording available as soon as that is ready. We will email all those who are registered for this program and probably be sharing that through our YouTube channel. Um, so I think one of the many, many uh, deep um, topics that has emerged from so many of your comments, so, uh, I've heard over and again uh, references to um, the, this earth, the environment, to water particularly, um, uh, and we uh, heard reference to you know, the water protectors here, but uh, the role of water that Brian just spoke to in uh, many contexts, specifically in Kabul and Afghanistan, to uh, what Runbir you were sharing earlier in terms of uh, your, uh, all that that, that uh, frames uh, your the Kurdish community and all throughout that region and so many other places. We know that just this in the past week, we saw headlines uh, here on this in the Americas about the drying up of the Colorado River um, and how that uh, has is being drawn upon. And we know that that is a profound issue in Palestine and Israel and so many other places. So I, I wonder for uh, our speakers, if anyone would like to share a little more about that connection, um, particularly in the context of maybe your faith uh, practice and how that uh, informs you, but uh, anything that you'd like to say about water in that. Uh, I think I saw one hand. Um, okay, so I see a bunch of hands. All right, so uh, I, I'm gonna uh, call on Chrissy first, and then I saw um, both of our Bobs. Um, so Chrissy. Yes, thank you. I've been um, saying something that I learned uh, while participating in land and water defense in uh, Abya Yala, what Norteños call Turtle Island, and um, what you know colonialists call the United States. Um, <laughs> and that is that we're all connected by the water, and certainly um, climate catastrophe and environmental racism is the fight of our lifetime. And it's the fight that is connected to everything else. And of course, all of our fights are interconnected. All of our struggles are interconnected, but um, we know that the US military is the world's largest polluter and um, definitely has the by like over a thousand times. So yes, it's important for me to recycle and to compost and to decrease my consumption. But at the same time, I can do nothing as an individual. Um, back to what Brian was just um, reverberating back to me, you know, we can only do it if we're all committed to doing it together. And so not only are they the world's largest polluter by more than a thousand times, um, they do that in conjunction with uh, huge organizations. I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but Raytheon and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, also polluting the planet tremendously. And we know that Black and Indigenous folks and working folks and poor folks and disabled folks uh, and queer folks are all most greatly impacted by the this greed, by this, like, by these types of hoarding, right? And the US military, which has been taught to me um, by Brian and Brian, my co-director, who's also on the line and many others, um, is that they also have the power, um, you know, in the, in the blink of an eye to destroy all of this with the way that we stockpile nuclear weapons. So 
all of those things are very, very, very much connected. And we have an obligation. We have an obligation to each other, to um, the land, to the water. And when I was saying that, you know, we need to have this international, interdependent, intercommunal, global perspective, but we really need to be rooting in place, connected to land. And, um, and you know, all of these struggles are, are happening in parallel all around the world in all of our communities. And so we must do what we can from our own place where we have responsibility, right? Where we have a responsibility to, and that means the corporations in our backyards who are, um, who are putting pipelines who are raping and pillaging Mother Earth with pipelines and other extractive industries, uh, literally in our backyards, that threaten while we're going through these droughts, that threaten to contaminate the last of our fresh water resources. Line three, the Canadian um, Corporation Enbridge's um, Alberta's Tar Sands Pipeline which is going through Anishinaabe territories in northern Michigan uh, and northern Minnesota at line three, at line five in northern Michigan, the Colonial Pipeline Project in, in Texas and surrounding, surrounding states, the Mountain Valley Pipeline in uh, Virginia and West Virginia at Bend Mountain. Um, all of these pipelines are raping and pillaging Mother Earth and all of them are are poised to destroy the Mississippi River at a, at least 22 river crossings. You know how many people get their water from the Mississippi River? A lot of people get their water from the Mississippi River. And so all of these intersections, I could go on and on, but I feel very pressed for time as well, are really, um, really need to be in the forefront of our mind. We can't be afraid to share these facts with our families, with our neighbors, with our um, fellow congregants, parishioners, um, uh, people of faith, what have you. And we can't be afraid um, to, to keep looking. We can't look away. Um, we have so much to lose and there are very few people who are making these decisions on our behalf and we can't let them do that any longer. Thank you, Chrissy, so much. Um, Bob Brashear, um, yes. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about expanding our understanding of what it means to uh, love our neighbors. And not only is it all humanity, but if you look at the uh, mythic understandings of where we come from in the uh, Bible myths, we are created of earth. We are as human beings, uh, Adam means earth person, earth, earth one. Uh, to the extent that we are created of earth, the entire creation earth is our brother and our sister, our sibling. And love of neighbor has to extend to loving the earth. And the only way we can truly love our neighbors is if we love the earth as well, which means we have to be responsible stewards for it. And I appreciate Chrissy's call for us to do that where we are, whether that means uh, for denominations to do actions against the corporations that, that have their money, whether it means protests wherever something is happening like a pipeline, we have to do that wherever we can. But but our understanding of loving our neighbor has to expand to loving the earth. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, Bob Herbst, did you want to offer something as well, please? Um, briefly as well. Thank you. Um, I, I want to offer just a, a talk about how this fits into what I was saying earlier. I am all for thinking of ourselves as connected that we're all in this together. We all have to do something. We need to love our neighbor and we need to be responsible stewards. But that is not gonna get us where we need to go because what we need to do ultimately as a global community is to regulate the distribution of clean water. We need to eliminate the destruction of the sources of clean water. We need to explore desalination on a grand scale to create more water. It's an allocation issue. It's the same issue that the, our founders faced 
in terms of allocating the revolutionary war debt. They couldn't make it, make decisions on how to allocate that in an Articles of Confederation where 13 states all had to decide unanimously on a plan. That's the problem we're in now. We have no global way, no political way, it's a political problem, of, of determining as a global community how to regulate the supply and allocation of water and the production of, of more of it. And that's why I say that the fundamental issue is creating a global politics. It's, it's, a, it's a political issue, ultimately, a, a means by which we can all come up with a decision-making uh, set of global institutions, executive, legislative, and judicial, where we can hammer out the issues and make decisions that are considered legitimate, by a species of majority rule. If we can't do that, I mean, we've been talking about climate change in all kinds of different convocations from Kyoto to Paris and, and, and many others for the last decades and decades, but we still require unanimity in order, in, in order to, to, to come up with a plan and we, we haven't done that. And that's why we are stuck in the, in the pot that's heating up, we're the frogs in the pot and we can't jump out because we have no way politically as a global community to jump out. So we need to focus on, yes, coming together, but doing it in a, in, a, in a way where we create a kind of union, a political union so we can make these decisions. Thank you, Bob. I want to call on him beer, but before I do so, I just want to, um acknowledge that uh, there, there was in the Q&A, there was a, a thoughtful qu question to this point about, um, uh, about uh, uh, further to this question. And we wanna see if we can get one answer after Runbeer to a question about incorporating teenagers and multi-generational work. So Runbeer, please respond to this. And if we can get one more, and then we're gonna try to wrap up quickly. Welcome. So, <clears throat> I would like to say that as a species, we humans, we are not the only ones who depend on water. Like water needs to be, we need to live, like for instance, like the, the in, 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 in like Mesopotamia and, 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 and Zagros mountains, like the Turkish government have built like big dams. And this is destroying like the environment, the, the, the habitat for everyone. Uh, I mean, like Turkey is also like, it's it's not it's a part of their occupation of our land they don't want us there like they want to take our resources they want to take the resources from everyone human and other than human populations of of, of that of the place uh, like they bombed the area where i come from like a couple of like two days ago like they they send their drones and bomb all this area while they're also like taking the water like they produce like hydroelectricity and send it to the Western part of Turkey. So it's like, which is, it's racist. <laughs> so like there is a lot of racism, a lot of anthropocentrism and everything which we can define like in like put in the frame, framework of colonialism and in the, like how we manage water. We don't have the right as a species to manage water. Water needs to free, uh, needs to be free and we need it needs it needs to like be like it needs to be able to like feed and water all the plants and species and communities like that depend on it we like mesopotamia exists because tigris and euphrates managed to flow all the way to southern what's now southern iraq human civilization as we know it depends like it was created by tigris and euphrates and now it does like, it barely reaches Basra. <laughs> like it barely reaches Southern Iraq. Like it's, it's getting desertified because of this, like our water management. We need to leave the water alone. Thank you so much, Rundir. Thank you all for those really deep um, 
comments about this topic. I want to ask if one person would like to respond in addition to what Chrissy has already put into the chat in some lengthy comments about the, in the work of intergenerational organizing through her organization, IRTF. If there's anyone else who would like to speak briefly to the topic of how you work with next generation leaders uh, in your organizing. Chrissy, would you like to speak for a moment just to give some specificity to what uh, you wrote into the chat, which not everyone may have access to? Sure, yeah. Um, I am so, so overly blessed by, um, by the young people who come to our organization to seek organizing training. Um, we call them interns, we call them fellows, we call them program associates. There are all, it's just based on, you know, how many hours a week that they're able to commit to working with us, but we pour into them, um, trying to get them to participate in different experiences, right? Like resisting the, the air shows where the military jets um, fly over our city and re-traumatize um, refugees. Um, we we want to create, uh, you know, national shows of peace rather than um, national shows of destruction. We bring them to the US-Mexico border. We bring them to fight pipelines. We, um, I really, really appreciate Renee's comment. Um, and that goes, I think, back to the rematriation uh, of getting us back to our connection to land, uh, getting people to understand how our food gets to where it is and um, that sort of thing. So definitely um, all sorts of different projects and programs. Uh, we really like to build coalition. So we're part, uh, we are very close with the Sunrise Movement here in Cleveland. Um, we're very close with um, BIPOC organizations which started before and after the uprisings last summer, uh, which are focused on mutual aid um including community gardens and um different sort of uh neighbor delivery services for people who need um to get their needs met uh during covid and can't um go out because they're immunocompromised all of these different types of things um we find that that young people you know like they're still living they're learning they're loving they're growing they still need to have experiential uh, experiences, even while we have to be careful because of um, because of this uh, international pandemic. Uh, so we take on a couple dozen interns every year, and ever since the pandemic started, we've done a hybrid program. So so it's um, digital organizing, but people who are close by and are um, physically capable of being in person, we do um, stuff. Uh, distanced and masked and or outside in person. Um, COVID, I think, certainly helped us uh, under re-understand or reconsider what we're willing to go risk our lives for, right? And so I remember at the beginning of the uprising last summer, I was willing to contract COVID because I couldn't take it anymore. Um, seeing my siblings uh, murdered on the street. And I couldn't get that sound of the young man in Colombia calling for his mother. I haven't gotten him out of my dreams for more than half of my lifetime. So, um, so yeah, we have to do all of these things together. Inside and outside of COVID, we rely so much on teachers and professors to invite us to share their platforms in their classroom, um, whether that's in person or virtually, just to have a space and a captive audience to practice um, with some popular education tools and models, what it means to um, discuss and, um, and unpack some of these uh, systems of oppression and how it relates to um, these young people's lives. Um, they uh, have so much to teach us. And so I'm just grateful to get to learn um, from and with and alongside them. Inspirational. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for bringing those words to us. And again, for all that you do and for all that each of you do, and I mean that very directly 
to this amazing panel of um, organizer, activer, activists, spiritual and community leaders um, from across the globe. Thank you one and all for what you have shared with us today. This has been really uh, profound for my heart and my spirit. And um, I know for everyone joining us today. Thank you all as an audience for joining us from around the world. We're gonna have a closing prayer. Um, uh, and as we um, prepare for that, I just wanna again, bring your attention. This, this Religion, Peace and Sanctuary program is a preparation um, gathering for the International Peace Bureau World Peace Congress this October in Barcelona. You are invited to attend that. Most of the speakers today will be at that uh, event in person. You can join in person or virtually. I know we've had people from uh, many continents on this webinar. Um, and now I'm gonna invite um, our closing prayer from Dr. Fernando Ona. We're so deeply privileged to have Dr. Ona with us today. Um, he's a public health professional of Filipino heritage, working within the landscape of health disparities and social justice who spent two decades working with survivors of torture and is currently working on a doctor of ministry degree at Boston University School of Theology. He is the first, we are so honored uh, at the Fellowship of Reconciliation to uh, welcome Dr. Ona as the first Walter Wink and June Keener Wink Fellow through FOR. And we're, uh, he's just a few weeks into that uh, launch of that fellowship, we're gonna be hearing words from him throughout the year. And this is an opportunity to hear from you in this special moment. Welcome, Fernando. Thank you very much. And it is an honor to witness each of our panelists today, very inspirational and helps us to reimagine and really actualize a different world. As Reverend Dr. Walter Wink wrote, history belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into being. And so we gather today and pray, O oh, creator and maker of peace, continue to invite, inspire, and ignite us into the liberatory work and manifestation of peace. We pray for all those who continue to actualize peace in intractable places, especially for those on our panel who engage with fallen powers within desecrated places of violence, conflict, and war. And for all our attendees here who are also deeply part of transformative peace work, actively engaged and within our faiths working together, continue to deepen our faith so that we can continue to transform our relationships with ourselves, with each other, and the created world amplifying our belongingness and connectedness. We hold sacred intentions for and honor all those who bravely engaged in principled advocacy, <laughs> accountability, action, and justice, who peacefully walk toward and face darkness with a life force of love and radical hospitality continue to encourage our ongoing commitments to deep in our mutuality and the intimacy of collective care and peaceful cooperation. We maintain invocations of spiritual nourishment, loving kindness, safe sanctuary, and deep compassion for those among us who continue to experience ongoing dehumanization, persecution, domination, and oppression led by the fallen powers as well as we pray for the transformation and redemption of the fallen powers themselves. Bless each of us engaged in peacemaking as we lift our prayers of lament and praise for a world transformed by the collective processes and powers of peace. Amen. Amen.